Cool. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, good morning, good afternoon. If it's good, no if it's good evening, thanks especially for coming on a Friday night. That's uh, an interesting time to be watching GitHub stuff. But yeah, no, so I'm excited to kind of talk to you, to you guys more about just general GitHub security stuff and how you could best secure your organization or enterprise account. Um, you know, if I would love to kind of get to know who's joining us and I see there's some good chats going on, people just having basic introductions. So yeah, we would love to see where you guys are calling in from and kind of just twitching in from if that's the thing. Um, but yeah, besides that, you know, we feel free to interrupt us at any time with questions and, and we have some good people here today to kind of talk through things. Uh, so with that in mind, I kind of wanted to just start off with some introductions on our end so you know who you know, you're ultimately listening to for the next 45 minutes to an hour. Cool. Awesome. So everyone could see it, I hope. I mean, yeah, I'm just going to go with that. Uh, cool. So hey, everyone, my name is Niels Pineda. Um, and so you might be wondering who exactly is this person you're going to be listening to. Uh, so just to tell you a little bit more about myself. So kind of one of my big passions, uh, it was actually great for me yesterday, is basketball. And so the NBA has officially started. And even though the Clippers did not get a win yesterday, it was still an exciting game. And I'm just glad to see it back and just, you know, glad to see uh, everyone kind of having a good time there in that Disney World bubble, which sounds awesome. Uh, and so you might be wondering kind of what does this picture have to do with basketball? Um, and so, you know, I've been passionate about basketball, playing it before I destroyed my knees, um, watching it nonstop with like family and friends. And then in college, I actually got a little bit more into writing, you know, kind of talking more about uh, the analytics, the, uh, the statistics, kind of all that good stuff. And so 213 Hoops is actually uh, a blog that I'm a part of for the Clippers Nation. And I actually designed this logo, which I like to think is pretty cool. Um, so kind of in line with that passion, one thing that it did cause a problem besides multiple dislocated knees, unfortunately, uh, is some would call it an addiction. I call it a hobby. Uh, but yeah, I got really into the sneaker game. I'm a bit of a sneaker head. I uh, love kind of just getting whatever I think looks good. Uh, but, you know, I got this nice collection. And then one of kind of the bigger problems that came about after I got this nice collection, um, her name's actually Kona. And so I adopted, uh, I, I rescued this dog. Uh, she's super, super kind. Uh, but she's also kind of the troublemaker and kind of a problem. Uh, and so I thought these pictures did a good job. This is literally one day separated where she loved this chair that we had. Uh, and then it took her all of, I would say, 10 hours to chew through it. And then she did not exactly have a good time after that. But she was still committed to uh, trying her best to sit on it. And so, you know, I love her, uh, but one of the big things is how can I get her to calm down a little bit? And then it goes to one of my other passions, which is um, actually going car camping, just kind of driving around. Uh, I'm based out of San Francisco and originally from LA. And so kind of just going up and down the coast, whether I'm going to San Diego, um, whether I'm hitting kind of the Big Sur area more in the central or going up north to like Marin, there's just a lot of great car camping spots. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I would love to kind of hear about you guys too in the chat, you know, what your passions are, why you're joining us, you know, are you very interested in security? Um, are you just kind of obligated to because you're an employee of GitHub trying to boost the numbers? Uh, but, you know, whatever it is, I'd love to kind of hear it in the chat. And from there, I will let Sarah and Senna introduce themselves. All right. Hey, everybody. How are you? Hope you're doing well today. Hey everybody, I'm Sarah Khalife. I am a solutions engineer here at GitHub. I'm very excited to be on Twitch today. It's actually my first time twitching, or that sounds weird, streaming on Twitch. <laughs> Obviously not the bestest uh, <laughs> Twitcher right here. Anyway, so, um, so to give you a little bit of background about myself, I'm originally from Cyprus and Lebanon. So you can see a couple pictures there from me in Cyprus and Lebanon. Um, that middle picture is me of the is my favorite spot in Cyprus. It's this place called Cape Greco. Um, it has a really cool, like, cool cave that you can go climb under, or you can go cliff jumping into beautiful blue waters, as you can see in the background. Um, I kind of wish I was there today, but right now I'm actually in San Francisco, which is also a nice place to be, so can't complain. Um, and I live here for uh, the past five years, which is pretty awesome. 
Well, so what have I been doing during quarantine? So if you can scroll down a little bit, Niels. I've been doing a lot of things. I've uh, been trying to keep myself busy, have really tried to embrace the quarantine life of making bread, as you can see in that middle picture. Uh, almost everybody and their cousins have made bread uh, <laughs> over the past couple of months. Uh, every time I try to go to a Safeway or to somewhere to buy some flour, it's always out. So I've also joined the train of making bread. In uh, the past couple of days, actually the past week, I've done a couple of the things that I haven't done before. Yesterday we had an awesome cooking class and I made ceviche, Peruvian ceviche for the first time, which was delicious. And then last week we are, well, not not last week, but in the next month we will be presenting at KubeCon. Um, I'll be presenting at KubeCon. You guys should check it out August 19th. Uh, kindly validating your Kubernetes application. So check it out on KubeCon. Um, and that's it about me for right now, but I wanted to share some awesome news that I just found out pretty much this last week that GitHub sponsors, I don't know if you had heard of GitHub sponsors, let me know if you haven't. Um, we can give a quick overview and then I can send some awesome links. But GitHub sponsors is now uh, sponsoring people in Malta and Cyprus and 34 other countries. If you are an open source developer, if you are a maintainer of an open source project and have been contributing to the open source world, this is a way that you can get a little bit of help to maintain that open source project that you've been doing. So check it out, especially if you're in Cyprus or in Malta or any of the 34 other uh, regions that we cover. Definitely an interesting way to you know, get a little um, help on the side. And that's it from me, so I'll pass it over to Senna. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Senna. Um, I'm also a solutions engineer here at GitHub. Um, Sarah and Niels and I kind of started around the same time, so it's been really fun um, hanging out with them. But um, yeah, just a little bit about me. I, I really like photography. I, I haven't been able to do that a lot so far since I've been in quarantine, but um, in particular, I have, I have family in Turkey, so I really like going there and photographing like street cats and street dogs. And this is just a kitten that my grandmother was taking care of. So um, that's one of my favorite cats I've ever <laughs> kind of like taken care of. Um, so that's one of my photos. And if you scroll down a little bit, Niels, um, I also, you know, since I've been spending a lot of time at home, I've, um, I bought a few Calatheas. <laughs> um, I started off with the Calathea Freddy, which is the one on the top. And then I bought these other two kinds recently. I just really, really like this type of plant. So a lot of the time I spend is, yeah, taking care of my plants, talking to them <laughs> and making sure they grow healthy. <laughs> And um, the other thing that I spend a lot of time doing is riding my bike. So if you scroll down a little bit, um, I'm, I'm also based in San Francisco. And this is a really popular route in the Marid Headlands, um, right across the Golden Gate Bridge. It's called Hawk Hill. So yeah, that's really something I've been, I've been spending a lot of time doing to kind of clear my head. And it's just really nice to get outside. Um, yeah, so that's a that's a little bit about me. Santa, I have a quick question that I've never asked you. Yeah. Did you take this photo while biking? Like, are you good enough to bike and pull out your camera? Or <laughs> did you stop and take it kind of in the middle of the street? No, uh, my my friend Susan that I that I ride my bike with a lot. Um, she took this photo of me. <laughs> no, I did not. I was not able to find a selfie stick that long. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, it's really beautiful um, out in the Marine Headlands, so I, I really like that photo. <laughs> cool. Yeah, awesome. Um, hope you guys are glad to have us hosting you. Uh, and I'm really excited to kind of just go over different security things with GitHub. But one quick call out I wanted to make if more people are shuffling in or, you know, 12 or 13 minutes late, which is fine, um, is actually GitHub came out with something really awesome this week. And it's actually the GitHub public roadmap. And so this is one thing where you're actually able to really see kind of what GitHub has their focus on and what they're going down the line with. And so here's a kind of readme outlining how you could kind of better read it 
I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So we could kind of just jump into the meat of things. Uh, in this case, it's asking me to single sign on, which we're going to go over. Don't worry. Um, and so jumping into the project, you're going to be able to see all of the different things that we have in the roadmap, um, whether they're going to be beta, alpha, GA, uh, kind of what they're touching on. And so if you're interested in security and compliance, like I'm, I'm guessing you are uh, for being in this talk, you could click it, filter it out and see the general ship date uh, that kind of we're hoping to have uh, delivered on. And obviously it's one thing to be able to kind of look and understand, okay, these sound cool, but I want more information. Uh, each one of these actually has its own issue that kind of speaks more to what it's gonna look like, what the intended outcome and use case are, and just a general summary. And so I think this is all really exciting stuff that you know we're just kind of sharing what we're focusing on. And so I highly recommend you guys go kind of through this try to understand if there's anything that excites you that you want to kind of reach out to account managers or just people like myself, Senna and Sarah about. Yeah, this is the most github -y way GitHub can share their roadmap, to be honest. The showcase of projects is pretty cool, but this really gives it a lot of transparency. So we're so excited to have this available to show to everybody. Yep, cool. Um, and so I guess we could kind of start going a little bit more into security, what I assume you got, what everyone came for. Uh, and so I'm actually going to start this kind of in one of my uh, kind of sandbox environments. And so this is my sandbox enterprise account. And, you know, one of the ones that I really want to use this as a use case for to try to make it seem a little bit more exciting and relatable. Um, it's actually an establishment and business that really taught me about sales and also the importance of securing very specific secret information. And that is actually the Krusty Krab. And so I was a big SpongeBob fan and uh, for all of you fans out there, I guess non-fans as well. So it's basically a restaurant that's in Bikini Bottom and they have a big competition with the rivalry. And so the rival uh, restaurant is always trying to steal their secret formula, which we hosted here. Um, we're not actually going to show you what the Krabby Patty secret formula is, but if there's any uh, um, Hitchhiker's Guide, uh, I'm completely blanking on it, but uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know, the secret to life, the universe, and also Krabby Patties is 42. Um, on top of that, you know, you could store other information. I put this in here intentionally to say, please don't do this. Uh, do not try your best not to store personal identifying information within GitHub and clear text. Uh, that is not the best use case or place to store it. But kind of what I also wanted to plug here, um, obviously we know what's going on in the world. COVID's impacting everywhere, including in Bikini Bottom. Uh, it's especially tough on restaurants who, you know, they might not have the best processes in place to work with uh, delivery apps or just have a good website. And so I actually went ahead and made a Krusty Krab website using GitHub Pages, which if you haven't used GitHub Pages, it is awesome. It's a very quick way to be able to just write the code that you need to be able to have a website. And then you just have to make the repository the same name uh, as, your, uh, as your organization or username, add.github.io, and it immediately hosts it. And so we could actually see if we go to crustycrab.github.io, you'll see this website that I made. Um, and it was just a lot of fun kind of just being able to play around with this stuff. Uh, so really quick, just to plug some of the stuff, because I am a fan of my attention to detail. Sorry if I'm being cocky. Um, but obviously, Bikini Bottom is also taking COVID seriously where masks are required. But you could also order things with Scuba Eats and Coastmates. Um, you have a little bit more information and me trying to better understand, you know, how you can bring in more business to a more old fashioned restaurant. I've traveled a lot. I've been to a lot of new kind of cool eateries and stuff. And over here, uh, I tried to add it, you know, they have edgy named IPAs and rustic wooden tables. Uh, and then finally, there's some reviews from random people. And so if anyone wants to look at the website and just kind of look at what, you know, dumb stuff I put in there, obviously, it's welcome. But yeah, so obviously, this is a super important thing. Because in businesses today, you need to make sure that you have accessibility to your product, whether it be, you know, an application, some specific piece of software or a Krabby Patty. And so what I wanted to do was I kind of wanted to start talking a little bit about how you would go about securing this specific organization that holds all of this um, sensitive IP. And so with all this sensitive IP, let's start going into settings and just going into kind of one of the basic things that is going to be necessary and it's going to be organization security. And so there's 
more or less, you know, two very basic things that you could set up. The first one's two-factor authentication. And this is interesting because what it does is when you require 2FA for everyone in the Krusty Krab org, it's actually going to require that at the beginning of their login for their specific GitHub handle. And so that's something you don't actually see with SSO because SSO is going to protect a little bit differently, which we'll go over. Basically requiring 2FA is going to mean when I log into, you know, Niels Pineda on GitHub, it's going to ask me for my second factor authentication. But what I kind of wanted to focus a little bit more today, because it's probably the biggest ask that we've seen, and this is what you get with enterprise security is SAML single sign on. And so um, for the most part, when you're integrating with added identity providers in the cloud, whether it be Okta, one login, you just want this next level of authentication to ensure that the person who's going through and, and signing on to GitHub is actually a member of that organization. Uh, similarly, if you're doing an on-prem deployment of GitHub, it's going to be, um, it's going to be with most likely like Active Directory and LDAP, which we also support. And, you know, if that's something you guys are interested in for another demo day, please shout it out in the chat and we're happy to kind of go through that flow as well. But today we'll be focusing on SAML authentication. Um, cool. Santa, Sarah, anything you think I've, I've missed so far before I jump into it a little bit more? I think you covered all of it. I think it's a pretty good, good place to start. Cool. So let's go on and when you click enable SAML authentication, it's only going to need three fields that you have to fill in. And so I'm going to go ahead and go to my dev instance of Okta. Um, just because that's what I've played around with a bit more. But like I said, as long as it's a SAML 2.0 provider, this workflow should more or less be the same of just grabbing a sign on URL, an issuer or and your public certificate. And so I'm going to start completely from scratch. So you could see how pretty efficient this integration is. And so I'll go ahead to my applications. You could see that I have a couple of ones that are standing up already, you know, just in case something went wrong in this uh, demo, have some backup plans. And so I'm going to go ahead and add an application. And what's nice is GitHub actually has uh, native applications that are already in with the, that are already in the Okta gallery. And so you could see kind of the three layers that you're able to integrate with would be the GitHub Enterprise Cloud organization, which we're doing right now, the enterprise account, which was the first page that I showed you. And I'll be able to kind of talk through that a little bit more at the end of things. And then also server. And so I mentioned before, a lot of times you'll see an LDAP integration with server, but realistically, if you're also interested in doing uh, an IDP in the cloud to do a SAML single sign-on integration with your on-prem server, that's totally possible also. But in this case, we'll go with the organization and you can see that it has both SAML integrations as well as provisioning and that's going to be a key piece a little bit later. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and add it and you could name it honestly anything you want and so I'll just call it the Krusty Krab SSL. Uh, this is where it's actually important to get the naming convention right. You want to make sure that this is exactly what the GitHub organization is called and spelled. Um, I don't believe it's case sensitive, but realistically, why not just make it case sensitive or make it appropriate? So I'll go ahead and add this. So Krusty Krab SSO is online. Obviously, there's no integration yet. Nothing was stored between the two of them. And so I'm going to go ahead and add that integration right now where I view the setup instructions. And so to go a little slower, you go to the sign-on tab, view setup instructions. Again, this is almost identical to whatever identity provider you have. It will show you a slightly outdated screenshot of kind of how to get to the page that we were already on. And let me close some tabs because I'm terrible with that. Um, and I will go ahead and add this information in. So we got the sign on URL and I know it's not best practice to be showing my certificates and whatnot here. I will roll these later. So I'll add these in and I want to test it and I'm not sure if anyone caught it, but you know, I'd love to know if anyone caught it and could say, what did I mess up on and why is this going to fail? Let's go ahead and test it. And you're going to see that I don't actually have access to Crust Crab SSO because I'm not assigned this application. So I've, done this hundreds of times when I've just been messing around with this and trying to play around with things. Unfortunately, it's not cached, but let's go back quick step. And you can actually see in assignments, all I have to do is assign it to my account that I'm logged into, which my account is this Neil Spineda one. So I'll go add this. And let's go throw this back in.
and hope that this time when I test it, it doesn't fail. And cool, there we go. And so in this case, once I save this, we have single sign-on enabled. And that honestly took what, like 45 seconds, assuming I didn't make the mistake at the beginning. Uh, and so it's pretty easy. That being said, it's not everything. Uh, one thing I did want to outline though, is that there are different level levels of single sign-on with GitHub. Uh, and so what I will say is initially it's just enabled. And so it's not actually requiring or enforcing anyone to actually go through the SSO process right now. Uh, and you might be asking, why is that the case? And the reason that that's the case is because if I actually, let me go ahead and authenticate with it and actually explicitly tie in my single sign-on ident identity. If I want to require it, you're gonna see that it's actually gonna kick members out of the organization, which is obviously not ideal if you start out with that and then just kick everyone out. And so typically what we see is, you know, the admin is going to ultimately add in the enablement of single sign-on, let his uh, employees and let his coworkers know that it's gonna eventually kick them out. And then if it goes poorly, uh, then they will have to just uh, basically go through that off flow. Um, but if they enable it and they link their SAML identity, then there's not gonna be any problem here. Um, and so Sarah, I know I'm about to pass it to you. Uh, are you good to go with me? with me kicking you out of the IDP? Yeah, can you actually, so how do you normally add a user to your IDP to do that automatic, uh, to do that, um, uh, to allow them to authenticate through SSO? Yeah, yeah, it's the exact same thing. It was the same issue that I hit initially, which would be to assign the specific person. And so in this case, you know, Sarah's already in, in it. And so I'm gonna add it to her so that she could, um, so she, that she could authenticate her account with the IDP. And so, Again, it's pretty simple, especially if you already have user groups that exist within Okta. It just becomes easier where you could assign based on group. Um, one of the other nice things for sign-on as well is that you could leverage whatever additional sign-on methodologies and requirements and policies that your IDP uses. And so in this case, like with Okta, and again, I think most IDPs, you could have IP zones, you could have um, based on geography. And so if you're within a certain location, that has to allow you to authenticate. And so you're able to kind of complement both systems by, by adding the two on. And so with that in mind, um, Sarah, are you good? Have you authenticated everything? Yeah, I'm authenticated. Cool. So Niels, hey, um, I was wondering, can I get a raise? I've been working pretty hard on crustycrab.github.io and, you know, I've contributed to the secret sauce and, you know, I think I deserve a raise based on the amount of work that I've done. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave you on red. And I'll just straight up take you out of the IDP. Did you just so fire me? This, you know, in the event that an employee leaves um, or gets fired for asking for some amount of raise and <laughs> crab, that's not going to happen. Um, yeah, so that's typically the workflow that you would see, right? Whether it be a more manual process where you have to go and actually delete the users outside of the um, IDP. Oh, or um, you might have like an integration with Workday where if they get laid off or whatever it is, it automatically takes them out as well. And so in that case, I went ahead and took Sarah out and that should be good, right? Unfortunately not. Um, there are some corner cases that you have to consider and I will pass it off to Sarah to kind of let her show you these corner cases. Awesome. Oops, let me pull it up. All right. So I'll wait a second till my screen loads. Sweet. So Niels, I think you forgot something. I think you didn't realize that the SAML session is 24 hours. So I still have access because you didn't remove me from my enterprise org. So thanks so much for removing me from GitHub, from removing me from your SSO, but I think I'm gonna take my code with me. So let me see what I can do now that I still have access because my SAML session still didn't expire. Sweet, I still have settings access. So therefore I'm an admin for the repo. So what can I do as an admin of this repository? So let's scroll down here. Huh. So I think I'm gonna take the code with me. What do you think? I, um, 
I deserve to work on the, I deserve to take the code with me because I deserve, I, I worked on it so much and it's all the stuff that I worked on. So why should Niels and Krusty Krab Corporation own it? That's not fair. So let's change this visibility, make it private and then rename. And then once I make it private, I think I can transfer it over to a new super secret repository. I mean, super secret organization. Oh, if I could type my password correctly, and then I can steal the code. All right. Oh, sweet. So I changed the v repository visibility. I'm able now to transfer the ownership and I'm able to archive it and even delete the repository. Well, what Niels didn't realize is that I, the SAML session's active and I was an admin before and I had all these capabilities beforehand. So since the admin, se since the SAML session was still active, I can't, I can still do a lot of the things that I could do, even though he removed me from the SSO. Because I didn't have to go through the SSO flow again, I didn't have to reauthenticate. So GitHub still doesn't know because there's no communication between after you go through that SSO original com uh, communication. So let's transfer this repository over to my end. I'm gonna take this to my super secret, super crusty crab because I'm better than just crusty crab and take that over to that my new organization. All right, so transfer it over. So let's jump into this and see if it's here. Sweet. Wait, so since the pages are based on the repository name, I also took down his website. You're gonna lose all your business, Niels. All those fish are not gonna have Krabby Patties because of you. Uh, no, they will. They're just gonna have better ones. So what did Niels do? What did Niels forget? Can anybody uh, let us know in the chat? In the meantime, let's rewind. I'm gonna give this back to Neil so then he can figure out how he can actually fix his organization to make it more secure, but still allow for collaboration. So let me transfer this back to him and make it more, um, even though, you know, I'm a, at the end of the day, I'm a good human being. I shouldn't steal his repository and steal everything in it. So let me just transfer it back. And then I'll pass it over back to Niels to show you what he could have improved. All right, so now it's back in Krusty Krab. Cool, uh, yeah, give me a second while I pull that up, make sure it's back. And let me stop sharing my screen. There we go. Cool, so yeah, I have it back now, thankfully. Um, I made a quick commit, so I hope that it's back up and running because yeah, there you go. So it's back up and running. Things look good. And so, yeah, the question goes, you know, what, what was the problem? What could I have done better? I'm not trying to say GitHub securing the organization isn't great. Uh, up front, there were a lot of things that I explicitly did to allow Sarah to get to that point of being able to steal the repo. But one of the things that I think is super important to be able to integrate on top of SAML single sign-on is actually going to be a provisioning piece of that. And so we saw it earlier when I was setting up the application, but the provisioning piece is so that that workflow that you have when you remove someone from the organization um, or you remove them from Workday or, or whatever it is also takes them out of their specific service provider application. And so you could see, you know, with Sarah, one of the problems was that she did have her SAM linked identity and she did have an active session as well. And so that's something that's actually de uh, determined by a token from the identity provider is how long this session is going to last. Some of them let you edit it. Some of them won't. Uh, and so it's completely up to that. Octas is by default 24 hours and they don't actually let you change that. So one of the things I could have done, but if I was, if I was knowledgeable enough to do this, I could have done something even better. I could have go gone ahead and revoked her SAML session. And that would have basically said, okay, she's now not able to authenticate. And so even if she was still lingering in the org, but I had required single sign-on, she wouldn't have been able to access it because when she got to the redirect page to this uh, dev instance of Okta, it would have automatically been shut down. And so what I'm actually gonna do here, I'll remove her from the organization as well. That's something that could have happened. Uh, but no. again, one of the problems there is, you know, if you knew that from the start, then that's a huge manual process. And so that's where provisioning comes in handy. Um, and so if you go to this provisioning tab, uh, hopefully this should be fine, but let me go ahead and configure it. 
I'll enable it. Authenticate with GitHub Cloud. Uh, sometimes this could be a little bit flimsy if I do it as many times as I have, which I've probably made this integration hundreds of times. Looks like it was perfect this time. Uh, I take back what I said. It's an absolutely perfect integration. Don't question it. Um, and so I'll go ahead and save it. And from there, it's going to ask you what, what do you want to allow in this provisioning um, aspect of it? Because ultimately what's happening is it's leveraging GitHub APIs to be able to create a user, update their attributes, or deactivate them. And so in this case, I could go ahead and save it. And what's going to happen is if I go to assignments and now you'll see over here, let's just make sure, you know, I'm not cheating you or anything. You could go ahead and see that there's no pending invites. I will now assign it to Sarah again. And you will see, hopefully, that there is a pending invite now to escalife at github.com. And so one thing I want, I also want to establish is kind of what is being um, stored and what's being understood on both sides. And so on the SSO side, on the identity provider side, there is no concept of a GitHub handle or an account. It's just the name ID. And so when you send an invite, it's either going to go to the name ID or depending on your settings, it might go to the specific user's email address, depending on what, um, what their profile looks like over here. In this case, the primary email is the same as the username or the name ID, so it's gonna to go to that. And so you'll be able to see when Sarah accepts it, this is where GitHub is, is more knowledgeable. She's going to be able to accept an invite and then link her account. And what GitHub is then going to store is going to be a specific identity for SAML as well as Skim now to understand, you know, hey, this is her account and we're storing her name ID with her GitHub handle. And so if I go to manage, I will be able to see her SAML linked identity as well as her scheme identity. And so you could see this is the name ID. Uh, I can revoke it if I want, like I did before, as well as the different information that I have on her. And so this is actually something really important I wanted to point out because it comes up a lot uh, and I totally understand why, but when you're an enterprise account admin, you want to know, you know, what are the email addresses, exactly who is in my organization when I provision them. With the way that GitHub structured with personal accounts, we're not able to just share their email address unless they explicitly make it public. And so you wouldn't necessarily have a way to, to audit that. And that's also why this SAML and SKIM integration is so important is because when you do add this in, while we view, you know, the personal email address as Sarah or Senna or whoever's uh, personal information. This is something that we view as enterprise or organization level information because it is tied to your enterprise owned identity provider. And so from there, you're able to actually pull the username along with what their SAML name ID and skim identity are, which are almost always email addresses. And they're usually the ones that you're going to hold within the enterprise account. And so that's something that's super easy to do. Uh, there's actually a really cool open source uh, gist that kind of goes over what that would look like. Uh, Sen is going to drop it in the chat. And so it's going to be really, really helpful if you just need to start kind of auditing a little bit better. Um, and Sarah, you have anything else to add on top of that or Senna? Yeah, I wanted to say that this is awesome because it automatically allows you to manage this and manage your user base. So automatic deprovisioning, automatic provisioning, if you're, they're part of the SSO and you have them, um, skim automation already configured. That's not only with Okta, that's with other IDPs as well. It just makes your life easier as an admin or as an operations lead and as well as from the security side because then you know whoever has access to the org is part of your SSO. Yep. And now and that on, we... Oh. Yeah, and on that front really quick, you know, if the workflow was the same as before where, you know, Sarah was ultimately let go. All you do is you take... <laughs> I got rehired. Yeah, so, sorry for picking <laughs> on you so much. I know we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this should take a quick second, it actually. There you go. And so you could see it took, you know, five or 10 seconds for me to remove her from the identity provider. And that gets reflected on GitHub as well. And so that's the integration that you want. Again, the most common thing that I've seen is Workday, you remove someone or you deactivate their account that then in turn integrates with the identity provider, which deactivate or removes her account. And then from there, you let kind of the downstream motions happen with this actual service to also remove it. And so 
that's kind of the, one of the main workflows and why skin provisioning is super important. I will say that natively, uh, Skim is available for, I believe, Okta, One Login, and Azure AD. But at the same time, we understand how important this is. And so we actually have a Skim API that you could then build additional integrations if you're using uh, Ping or some other open source identity provider. And of course, on, on all of this, you know, I, I did mention before, the only reason Sarah was able to do this was because there were very specific policies that were actually not default in place. Um, that I had allowed for her to happen. And it just kind of shows the importance of those. And so I do want to go over a couple of policies, but before I wrap up kind of the conversation on enterprise org level scheme and SSO, Santa, were there any questions or Sarah, was there anything you think I missed? Um, one thing, I, I, there was a question I wanted to ask. So yeah. as, a, as a GitHub user, you know, I use my personal accounts. Um, I'm a part of an organization. Um, how does SAML SSO impact my experience and how does it kind of, what does my login experience look like? Yeah, so one of the big things with GitHub is we always are, you know, we want to empower developers. Uh, and one of the big things is it's a little bit different in single sign-on than what you would see with other applications. And so with other applications, you start your account and you start your day in SSO and that's the only way to log in. Where it's a little bit different from GitHub is, you know, what if you are ultimately working for uh, a specific a, a specific account or a specific organization, uh, and you need to be able to log in? Where it's going to be protected essentially is actually at the enterprise account or enterprise org level, and so you're still going to sign on as normal, so you could contribute to whatever open source documents that you want or open source projects that you want, I should say. But if you now want to go into the Krusty Krab, if you want to go to your overall enterprise protected resources, that's when you're going to have to do single sign-on. And so it's protecting the enterprise without stopping you or getting in your way or adding additional steps if you're looking to sign on to GitHub just to start contributing to open source projects. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, going from there, the next thing that I did want to go over were those policies that I, I put in place to allow us to do that. And so, you know, it, it might not seem like a big deal to go over when you first started, but this is honestly where I personally recommend everyone who's, you know, starting up an enterprise org or enterprise account to look at. There are only a handful of ones, but they're all super important. Uh, and so it starts with base permissions. So what are the base permissions for people who enter the um, organization to see what repository visibility they have. The next one is going to be repository creation. And so this is actually a really interesting one because I would say this is where, you know, accidents happen for the most part is, you know, you might be an open source developer, like I mentioned before, and also working for an enterprise. And maybe you make a repository and you accidentally make it public instead of private when you shouldn't have. And so if I go start. If I go to, let's go to GitHub and start a rep and make a new repository, you'll actually see now the default's private. And that's actually going to be different for a lot of people potentially on this call or on this Twitch stream, I should say, is GitHub actually just shipped this really cool feature. Um, and it may seem subtle, but I think it's really important. If you have a SAML single sign on linked identity and an active SAML session on, what it's going to do is it's going to change your default repository to private. So in that case, in the event that, you know, you are making something sensitive for your organization and you kind of just forget and it's default public, it's now going to be private. And so it just gives that added layer of kind of like data protection that you don't make those, make those mistakes. Going down and, and kind of focusing on other ones. These are all ones that I highly consider just to think about. Um, again, I think, how you how you take inner sourcing or how you take your development practices is going to differ from company to company but repository forking uh is all is obviously a big one if you want to allow private forks for the internal repos or private ones and then these are the ones that by default were actually turned off but i turned them on just for this demo purpose was the allowing of repository visibility change so i could go ahead and turn that off and the allowing of repository deletion and transferring and so if I had just made an enterprise org, didn't touch any of these settings, this use case that 
we talked through today actually wouldn't have been possible because the only people who would have been allowed to make visibility changes or delete repositories and transfer is actually going to be the org owners themselves. So what are some examples of permissions that you feel that your company or your enterprise will allow or not allow? What's the best policy set up for your uh, you know, organizations? If you want to answer in the chat. Yeah. And on top of that, it goes a level above this too. Um, and so we've been talking at the org level the entire time. Pretty much all of this is also applicable to the enterprise account level. And so these policies, and let me take some of this out of the way. Again, my tabs are definitely a problem and this is like not that bad, but I know it could get worse. Um, and so you could actually set policies at different levels. And so let's say for repository creation, I actually only wanted to allow for private and internal at the enterprise account level. Setting this is gonna make a global setting that goes downstream to all of the organizations that you could find within your enterprise account, in this case, by 18, including the Crusted Crab. So now if you go to member privileges, it's going to set them and say that you are not allowed to actually change these permissions at a lower at this level because they're determined at the EA. And so that's where I think a lot of the discussion could go is, you know, what settings do you want at the EA level versus what settings do you want at the org level? And on top of just policies, I know a lot of time we spent going over SSO. You could actually do SSO at the enterprise account level as well, where you enable SAML authentication. I mean, we have 16 minutes. And so let me just do that really quick because it's pretty straightforward. In this case, I already have my enterprise cloud account set up. Again, it's just choosing the different tile. And when you go to sign on, it's literally the same process. Ah, uh, no, that's wrong. Is this right? Yeah, it is. And so now if you put all of this in here, Let me test it. It's going to initiate. I did add myself, so that's good. And now when I save this, what it's going to do, it's going to ask for recovery codes that I will change those. And from there, yeah, now it's going to protect all of the organizations. It asked me to authenticate before, but I was already signed in. And this is going to go downstream to all of the organizations that exist. Um, in this case, I'll disable it. You guys saw my recovery codes anyways. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so with that in mind, that's largely what I wanted to go over for like SSO and policies. There's no questions on that. Kind of the last place that I wanted to point to, and I know Sarah has a lot more knowledge on, on this kind of stuff because her background and her kind of skills in automation is gonna be the audit log. So I'll let her kind of talk a little bit more to the, to the audit log at the EA level and the org level. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Niels. Um, so who here has actually looked through the audit log? If you're an enterprise owner or an org owner, you can see an audit log across your enterprise and across your org. So this is the enterprise view that Niels is showing right now. What's really, really awesome about this is that these, the enterprise that Niels has has multiple organizations. And these orgs can be, you know, coming in from um, people that have been acquired or say you're a large corporation and you have, you know, an transportation, aviation, um, healthcare divisions, and you don't want everybody to be in the exact same org. Well, this umbrella enterprise allows you to put all these orgs and associate them to one enterprise. Well, how do you monitor across all of that? Well, this audit log really gets into the more details of what's happening at each, uh, you know, at each event. All of these events are great to see and you can search across it. You can see that in uh, for Niels, we've only been working in the US because it's majority us three that work on his uh, organization. But in general, you'll be able to see across the entire world, you know, who's been working on what, especially if you're a large enterprise. Uh, what's really good about this is that you can grab all that information. And if we want to just jump into the org level audit log as well. So a lot of the times, not everybody can access the enterprise audit log because that might be owned by corporate, um, but then your organization is where you want to find specifics to your org and what's happening across that, that, part, of the, um, that part of the enterprise, I guess. 
Uh, in this case, you can again look through very similar things. All the all the GitHub events that we track are all going to be here. You can search amongst them. You can find when repos are deleted, created, and so forth. Well, what's really really awesome about this is that you can take this information because we have an audit log API and create automation around it. With that automation, you don't have to worry about every single time you have to make sure that you're monitoring by you know, hand and manually to check if somebody deleted a repo or transferred a repo like I did to Niels earlier. Um, he could have actually gone to this organization level or enterprise level audit log and seen that I removed or like Niels removed me as a member or I moved the, or the repo and transferred to somewhere else. You can track all of that. And once you can get that information, that means you can automate this. So if there's any type of events that you want to trigger, you can do that with the um, uh, audit log API. Well, the other thing that you can use to do that, and that's been recently announced over the past year, is GitHub Actions. All of these are GitHub events. So if you want something to happen on a specific event, for example, you want to make sure that um, whenever there's a visibility change across your repository, you can create an action that allows you to track, track that and say, hey, when the visibility change happens, please send a notification to this other tool. You can do that with GitHub Actions. So GitHub Actions allows you to really automate across the board, especially when it comes to auditing, monitoring, or even adjusting some of the components that you want to manage. And lastly, because automation is cool when you can just read through things, what really is helpful is um, type of all the other types of integrations that exist out there. So Terraform, there's a Terraform provider that actually works with GitHub. It's called the GitHub Terraform provider. And I know a lot of people have Terraform, uh, especially code, uh, uh, sorry, config as code. So you don't have to manage a lot of your, you know, configuration but manually every single time and then not be able to track the changes. Well, there's a Terraform provider that you can actually take and you can use it in GitHub Actions, which is a pretty cool workflow and super easy, or you can use it within your own Terraform uh, management tools that you have today. So all of that really boils down to Niels is awesome at securing the organization and he did a better job the second time around after he learned his lesson the first time but you don't want to do this manually every single time. You want to maybe run through it a couple of times to figure out what the changes, uh, what, what are some of the changes you want, but then there's tools that help you automate to see if this, these changes did happen. There's tools that help you automate how to configure your, um, you know, your repository or your org. Um, so with that, I know we are close to time and I want to open it up for if there are any questions in the chat that haven't been asked or if there's any other questions in mind. Yeah, and on, on top of that, if there's specific feedback, obviously we're happy to do that. If there's any specific topics you want to go over more in depth, we're looking for more things to talk about in these demo days. And so please feel free to reach out with any of that information or reach out afterwards with more questions. Um, there, there are a few questions in the chat that I wanted to highlight. Um, some about some documentation on our audit log API. Um, I just sent uh, one link on how you can access that and also sharing a really cool blog post by Kevin Allwell on how you can kind of like get started with our GraphQL API and how you can use the audit log. So I'm um, just sharing those right now. And there was another question that might be good for discussion. Um, there was a question about um, an enterprise account owner taking ownership of an org um, under the enterprise. I think I think you answered that, Niels. But um, just to echo that, you know, or organization owners they really own that content of an of an organization. You know, where all the repositories live, where all the teams are attached to, things like that. Yeah, and, and, and one thing too, and this is kind of more of my personal opinion on that, is that gives an incredible amount of power and privileges to the enterprise account owners to the point where they basically can take over whatever orgs they want. And so in the very, very, you know, hopefully it's not going to happen, but in the bad case of like a malicious EA owner, you could see where that goes really poorly, where they just start transferring all of their organizations or all of the company organizations out. And so that's why, um, that's one of the big reasons I, I prefer not having that in place. Uh, but we definitely have seen those use cases and do our best to work with whoever 
when that scenario comes up where, you know, someone leaves, they, for, they just forgot to change org owners before they left and it, then it becomes an entire issue. Um, so if that is the case, please just let us know and we'll do our best. Um, I won't be showing the GitHub admin panel, unfortunately. <laughs> so to add to that, um, not only that, it, it's a common practice to have more than just one enterprise account owner. You want to have at least two enterprise account owners at any time, just so you make sure that, you know, if somebody leaves or if something happens, another person has access to your enterprise accounts. If that is still, that's, you know, always configurable when you follow ticket to support, but that's a whole process, right? You want to make sure that you're covered from the beginning. So having more than one enterprise account owner is a good move. Um, another question related to security, but a little on a different aspect is um, how can you prevent people from submitting tokens in a public organization or in a public, uh, sorry, in a public repository? So that was one of the uh, questions. Well, GitHub has token scanning. So it does public token scanning across all public um, repos and it has an SLA with certain type of vendors. So for example, if somebody contributes, um, commits into their repo AWS credentials or uh, Azure credentials or Google Cloud credentials or other types of credentials. There is an SLA that we have with our vendors that say, hey, if this person, if there's a token that's been compromised, it needs to be handled by the company. So for example, AWS has a five second SLA where they will actually um, uh, void the token just in, or void the credentials just to make sure that nothing is exposed in time. And there's another type of workaround against, I guess, uh, private repositories. You don't, still don't want any credentials to be stored there anyway. So we have a tool called private token scanning. And then we can talk about that at one of our other upcoming sessions if somebody's interested or if many of you are interested in talking about it. It's some, there's some pretty awesome stuff that we can always cover. So feel free to message us and say, hey, I'm really interested in learning more about this. Can you host this in the next coming sessions? So one thing I, I want to, there's one oh, go ahead. Big question that came up. I'm curious about your thoughts on keeping OSS projects in separate org with separate security config via including it in your main org when the main org. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've seen it happen both ways also um, where I think that that's pretty important too, is kind of, you know, I think the greater conversation is around how do you want to split up organizations within your entire kind of enterprise account? And so I would say that's a way that we've seen it make sense too, because then you could put stricter organization um, policies around kind of the main org that does have SSO enabled, that does have kind of more security focused things enabled, um, and then put kind of your more open source focused ones that you want to allow public repositories for, you want to allow um, kind of those added access controls in. I've seen that be very successful and I could definitely recommend going that case. Obviously, they're both achievable. Um, if you want to put it all in one main org, you're going to start having to go through outside collaborators because that's how you get around the SSO enablement for contractors or if you do have open source or things like that. And they're still going to be public. But I would, I mean, I think you can't really go wrong either way. Yeah, and another thing to add is internal repository visibility. Um, so if there are people that are working within your enterprise, so if you go to the people's tab, Oh. In, this, uh, in that overview there, if you have people working in your enterprise and you want them to be able to access the private or not private, but the internal repositories only, only visible to your internal organization and to your internal enterprise, but still want them to work on the open source projects. Well, you still want to enable open source is great, but when you're working in an enterprise, you also want to enable inner source. Not everything can be public. So if you do have a separate org for open source, which is fine, and have a separate org for all of your more, um, more uh, uh, enterprise projects, so you don't want those to be exposed, you can add people. When you have an enterprise account, you have that capability to make them internal projects and have that inner source where people can access both repositories if they're internal and view them as you know, have read capability. So as a member on an enterprise, you have that capability to read across both your open source organization and your internal organization without having to make too much, uh, you know, having to configure your enterprise to a very extensive 
configuration to make sure that everybody has access to the right thing, that it, there is a new capability called internal repositories that can allow you to do that and still maintain your open source and still maintain your private repos. Cool, I think that goes through most of the chat. There seems to be some excitement about private token scanning. And so, you know, we're happy to do a demo day about that. But besides that, I mean, I'm happy to end three, two minutes early now. Um, and just want to say thank you everyone for kind of tuning in and listening to us talk. Yeah, great chats, great questions. I'm very excited to see uh, our next demo day based on your feedback. <laughs>